Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209. Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Hello and welcome to Garden Success. Uh, Today is a good day to be inside listening about gardening or talking about gardening on the radio because it's so darn hot out there. And I'm telling you, it, you know, every time I look and see 100 degrees over going to the horizon, uh, it's and not much rain in sight, if any. That's a kind of discouraging thing for a gardener. But we are going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, we hope you'll give us a call with some of your gardening questions. If you will write our phone number down, it's 845-5689, 845-5689. Or if you would like to email me, uh, perhaps attach some pictures, you can email garden success one word, at tamu.edu. And uh, if you will attach your photos rather than embed them in the text, it makes it easier for me to zoom in. And uh, while I'm also trying to talk on the radio at the same time, uh, and so uh, just make sure they're also in really sharp focus and some close-ups always help. Well, let's see. Uh, it is it is hot outside, and a lot of our questions we're going to cover today are related to that heat. Um, the um, uh, trees around town are really suffering, and a lot of plants are. A little uh, maple tree uh, down the street from me. Uh, just the other day, I noticed its its green color had had kind of uh, maybe kind of faded a little bit to, toward a tan. And I walked over and looked at it, and basically every leaf was on its way to drying up. And by today, it's already uh, halfway to brown, uh, just the whole tree instantly. All around it, the grass is wet, so I know people are watering. Uh, What's happening with that tree? Well, uh, I'm going to talk about some principles of things that go on with plants. Uh, And then I guess, uh, you know, it's coming up with this specific answer as to why did this tree die. Uh, I think it's easier to talk about principles uh, because as we as we start to uh, try to get specific, sometimes it is a little bit of a mystery uh, when it comes to plants. Uh, The the heat is putting an incredible amount of stress on plants, Uh, even plants that normally uh, are well adapted to this area, uh, when they're subject to the kind of conditions we've been having, that is really, really difficult. Um, so, for example, uh, hot temperature can affect photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis is the food factory of a plant. It's how the plant takes carbon dioxide and, and produces uh, carbohydrates that need that uh, plant uh, that the plant needs to survive and to grow and, and so on. Uh, they, the, the effect of hot and then you add to it the effect of dry. Uh, a lot of our plants can survive our summers, uh, but they need moisture in the soil in order to take up and pump through the plant. It, it has a cooling effect on the plant, but not a great degree, but it, it just hydrates and all the processes that are going on. And when, think of it as a highway from the roots to the top. Uh, when that highway gets clogged with traffic, and that could be things like uh, certain types of bacteria that can get into the plumbing of the plant, uh, or when that uh, highway uh, get, has a blockage on uh, where it's a, maybe a, a um, barrier put across it, everything backs up. And that could be things like a um, 
uh, tunneling insect, such as a borer, or it could be physical damage. Uh, some of the damage from the freeze we had February 21 uh, has continued to plague some of our plants because it killed a lot of tissues, and the plants are trying to regrow, but they're having to work around that. Uh, so that that's an, an incredible uh, stress on the tree, and so anything that slow that slows that down even will have the effect of uh, exacerbating the drought that the plants are using. So when temperatures get really high, uh, the ability of the plant to do a lot of its metabolic work uh, is hampered. And when a plant can't do that, you, now you have not only a stressed plant, well, maybe a lack of water, uh, certainly 100 degrees, uh, but you've got a plant that isn't functioning normally inside or can't function normally inside. Uh, for tomatoes, for example, when temperatures get above about 96 degrees, uh, tomatoes start to have that metabolic issues that they struggle with. And um, so well, I guess what I'm saying is uh, you think about these trees that are out there and they're catching the brunt of the sun. It's nice to be underneath them because they, they are catching the brunt of the sun. Uh, they've, they've got insects that are feeding on the sap that are, that are uh, taking some water out, and they just have all the other issues going on. And so as a result, we start to see a collapse of the system. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit more about this, but rather than just drone on right now, I think I'll go to the phones and we're going to take a call from Kate. Hello, Kate. Hi. Um, I missed the first few minutes of your last caller. I don't know if it was a specific tree. Uh, I think my question relates to that. I have several crepe myrtles. The bark is peeling off, mm -hmm. and one of them, I'm pretty sure, either has aphids or what is it called, bark scale? Bark or, scale, uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Do, does, does the bark scale drip sap like aphids do? Yes, it does. It produces yeah. a sugary water. Uh, it drips on my face. <laughs> well, there's probably two things going on there. Um, here, here's the fast version of it. The, the scale and aphids, they feed on phloem sap. That's the sap that's coming from the leaves and taking food all over the plant. Uh, that has a lot of sugar in it. And so when it gets on the trunk of the tree or plants below it, we get that black sooty mold growing uh, on the sugary substance that they put out. Then there's a little insect, or several insects, but the primary one now is a glassy wing sharpshooter that feeds on the, the young stems out around the periphery of the tree. And it's feeding on the xylem, the interior, uh, the water coming up from the roots. And they produce, a, they drink a lot of water and they excrete a lot of water. And so when you're feeling that little mist, or in some cases you can just stand there and see it falling all around, that's coming from those insects, not from the scale insects. Okay. Uh, treatment, does it have to be systemic or do I just bide my time? Well. And secondly, the tree with the whatever insect, um, Obviously, the bark is falling off, but even the trees that seem, quote, healthy, bark is really falling mm -hmm. extensively, and some of the bark is black. Okay. So the, the bark on the crepe myrtle that you're seeing, that is a natural process as the plant grows. Uh, trees have different kinds of bark, and some types of bark, like on an oak tree, uh, it just sticks there, and you get all the fissures in it, and it looks like an oak tree bark, for example. Crepe myrtles have bark that's kind of in sheets around the trunk, and as that plant expands the trunk, those uh, outer sheets kind of pop loose from their connection mm -hmm. to the next sheet below, and then you get that, it sort of curls and flakes off, sometimes big sheets, sometimes just little strips, uh, but that's normal. And it's been happening now for several weeks on crepe myrtles around town, I've noticed. Uh, it can happen, you know, you can see that any time of the year, but it seems like uh, it's been more noticeable this summer. But that is absolutely nothing to worry about. The black on it is just, again, the city mold from the crepe myrtle bark scale, probably, that's higher up in the tree. So the, the uh, secretions from, that are coming from the insects and the leaves 
is dripping on the bark of the trunk and then turning black. Yeah, it's a it, it's kind of a, almost a misty like uh, yeah dew falling on there. Very feel it. Uh huh. Yeah. And and that it the sooty mold is growing on that. It would be the same thing, Kate, if you mixed up some sugary water, some honey diluted, some honey in water, really sugary though, and you sprayed mm-hmm. it on the side of the tree trunk. You would then start okay. to see a mold grow. Now I don't know if that's true of honey. Honey has a lot of kind of uh, antibiotic type or not antibiotic, uh, just antimicrobial types of properties that, uh, but sugar water would, would do that. Uh, so uh, I would, as far as what to do about it, we're, we're kind of in a dilemma on that one. Uh, number one, it, they're not appreciably affecting the health of the tree. Uh, the crepe myrtle bark scale is the worst of the insects we deal with now on crepe myrtles, and it makes things black all over it, it it just you know it's it's, it's ugly to, to look at all that de- stuff on all your plants including the ones below but bees need the crepe myrtle blossoms and in the summertime crepe myrtle is one if not the number one source it's of a bloomer <laughs> pollen and nectar for bees uh, they've studied this and, and looked at the honey or the uh, pollen that bees are bringing back and it's primarily crepe myrtle this time of year so if you put a systemic in there, it's not necessarily going to go up and just kill all the bees, but it affects them. And, and sublethal doses of uh, pesticides can affect bees in, in their ability to function. Maybe they have trouble finding their way home or they have trouble mm-hmm. doing some other process that's part of their lives. And I just, you know, with all the concerns these days for pollinators, both honeybees and, and native bees, boy, I sure hate to just turn every crepe myrtle in town into a semi-toxic <laughs> uh, place for the bees to go. Uh, I'm not saying that using some of these products here and there is going to you know, be the end of the world, but uh, in general, I encourage people to, to, to avoid them when possible. Uh, we have some good information online about crepe myrtle bark scale and some of the options and things, but uh, the bottom line is the the most effective is a systemic, and we typically would be applying those in, in uh, May or, or, or April. Um, but I have, so that's a I have, preventative, but if we do nothing, as the seasons change, will the tree return to health? That, well... What we're finding is trees that have this, that don't have other problems, you know, it's not like a crepe myrtle that's barely alive to begin with. Uh, they they survive with it. And it, you know, it's taking sap out of the tree, but it uh, it doesn't it doesn't kill the, the crepe myrtle in and of itself. And I, I think that when you when you look at all the factors put together, I guess is what I'm trying to say, maybe some other option would fit, depending on the size of the crepe myrtle and where it's located uh, and so on. Uh, there are some surface uh, things you can spray. You could spray them at a time when the, the bees aren't active on the blossoms yet, uh, and they would help control some of the proliferation of scale. The scale goes through a process. What about neem oil? Neem oil in the in the trials we've seen has not been that effective, but an oil does smother small scale crawlers. Uh, an an oil application in and of itself, it's not the best thing that the best okay. am, among the best. And I, I would refer you to that that uh, publication because we could do a whole show just talking about this one pest. Uh, there's just that much information out there on it. Uh, but Texas A and M is part of a, a a group of southern universities that are studying this, entomologists from across the south, uh, and trying to figure out uh, what we go, where we go from here, uh, and trying to find a good solution. The, let me just say one last thing, Kate, though. Scale has its natural enemies, and they obviously are not eradicating the scale by any means, but they do move in, and they do reduce the temp- the uh, uh, populations. The, the twice stabbed lady beetle. It's a little black lady beetle, the size of a regular lady beetle, that has two red spots, one on each side. Um, that's why they call it twice stabbed. It's real easy to identify. Uh, that one loves crepe myrtle bark scale. And as we kind of back away from just continually treating the plants, trying to kill scale, uh, some of these natural enemies have a chance to come in and at least help with, with the process. 
but there's not a good silver bullet that doesn't come with some kind of environmental uh, backlash. And I'm assuming you can't see this scale. Yes, you can. It's white you can. and it's narrow. Uh, there is a there is a website, and I'm gonna pull it up here. I gotta find it. Uh, it's like crepe myrtle bark scale. Crepe myrtle bark scale. CMBS dot. So uh, don't go to AgriLife. Well, it, it it's produced with AgriLife information, and let me. I'm gonna find it as as we're talking here, but. Um, I have t trouble doing two things at once. I I'm, I'm doing this because I know there's a lot of people out there that uh, have issues uh, with crepe myrtle bark scale. So, and all right, here we go. And the address of it, let's see, go through these. Crepe myrtle bark scale, yeah. wow. I mean, I may have to hunt it down and give it a little bit later in the, um, in the uh, show. I'm not seeing it pop up as the top, but uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension uh, uh, Entomology has information on crepe myrtle bark scale. As and if you just do a search for crepe myrtle bark scale and uh, uh, Texas A&M, you'll it'll, okay. it'll pull it right up and it'll give you a lot of information on it. Other Southern Extension services do. They each have a little bit different information on there, uh, but all of those would be a good source for trying to to find out what the options are going to be. You are so helpful all the time. Thank you much. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. All right, let's uh, go back to the phones and the numbers eight four five five six eight nine and talk to John. Hey, John. Good morning. I got a, a question about our jujube tree. Okay. Uh, uh, according to Mary's book, it sends up suckers up to 15 or 18 feet away from the original tree. Mm -hmm. uh, are those suckers? Are they are they real jujube trees? I mean, if you dig one up, can you yes transplant it? Yes, they're genetically the same as the mother tree that they sprouted off of, or that they are connected to. So. Um, you you can do that. I I just jujubes are. Uh, there's a reason why, you know, you don't know where all the jujube orchards are in Texas because there are not a lot of them. And it uh, it they do grow here, and uh, they're very popular with some folks, and, and a lot of people aren't familiar with them. But the um, uh, issue with that root sprouting kind of makes them uh, a little bit of a pain in the yard. Right. Well, we've got it kind of out in the orchard, so it's, okay. we, we can dig them up or move them to do yeah. something with them. All right. Uh, the, also, in the book, it talks about in the if you want to have a healthy, prolific tree that in the winter time you should you should trim it back, cut it back, and and uh, shape it so that you you can. Of course, it's, what it's saying is keep the keep the limbs below 10 feet so uh, you have as good a chance as the squirrels are getting it. And <laughs> and uh, so we, it's, I, I think but that's what it said for the jujube, but we've got apron plum and, and several other archer kind of trees. Does that kind of that same pruning them back in the winter hold true for most fruit trees like that? Wow, it, that's the best time to prune our fruit trees, uh, our deciduous fruit trees. Uh, I would, you know, put I would say some different things if we were talking about citrus, for example. But uh, things like apples and pears and and plums and peaches, and we prune. We prune initially. We train the tree to develop strength in the branches, so that as it gets to be an older tree carrying heavy loads of fruit, it doesn't split apart. Uh, we also prune, and once a tree gets established to encourage new wood to grow. Uh, peaches and plums, there are, and apples and pears, they're producing on last year's wood. Uh, you especially notice it on peaches, for example, where you get a shoot that grows this year, and then next spring it blooms and fruits. And that shoot itself will never fruit again. But a side shoot off of it will then fruit the next year. So in pruning, encouraging new flushes of growth, we're, we're creating new wood for growing more fruit. Okay, I think I think that's. You sound just like what she read to me, so I, I think that's, exactly, that's <laughs> okay. right. All right, but I just didn't know if it applied to uh, the other 
fruit trees like that. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking right now online. A&M has a publication on just about everything, but I didn't think that. Yeah, they have one on jujubes. If you go to aggie-horticulture.tamu.edu and the Fruit and Nut Resources, there is a whole publication just on jujubes. And I would encourage oh. you to take a look. It's, got, it's full color, beautiful. It, it's very helpful. It is. It, this is not a good time to be gardening. I have to agree with you. It, it is not. No. It, it's a good time to be inside bragging about the garden you used to have or uh, planning your next garden. Clean up blackberries. All right. Uh, she asked me one more thing. Is it time to clean up blackberries? Yeah, yes. Once Once we finish harvesting, if you can get down there at the bottom and cut those canes off at the ground, uh, you know, with some leather gloves and, and uh, on your hand, just kind of pull them out. I use the pruners to help pull them out. Uh, then you all you've left behind is next year's cane, next year's fruiting canes. And that's a good idea. You want to top them off at about chest high also. I think that you're absolutely right. They, we've let them get, um, be a mess right now, so yep. we have to prune pretty heavily. Right. A briar patch is no fun. Yeah, if I wanted to give blood, I'd go to the blood center, not to the blackberry patch. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, take care, John. Let's go back to the phones and talk to Katie. Hello, Katie. Hi there. Uh, I have two questions. Okay. First one is on pears. The other one is on College Station water schedule. My pear trees are about 15 years old, 20 feet tall. What do I do to get a pear, or do I just kick, cut the top out? Um. They're they're how fifteen feet tall? You said twenty. Twenty, very tall. <laughs> of course, the heat is bothering them now. So so pears of all the fruit, they're the ones that want to grow straight up. Mm -hmm. And if you top them, you force them to produce side branches that go out and immediately go straight up. <laughs> and it's <laughs> it's very hard to encourage spreading open of the tree by pruning a pear. So what we do is we take those vigorous shoots and we pull them out to the side with a cord. I, if you don't have to mow around the tree, you can use a stake and a cord yes. uh, or, or a weight out there that can be moved. And you pull them out to about a 45 degree angle, maybe 60 degree at the most, probably more like 45. Uh, and after they sit there for a while, and you know, a couple of months like that, that branch is now going to stay leaning out like that. And so rather than trying to prune and get a side shoot to go horizontal or not, you know, at that angle, we we let them grow up and but not get become very stiff, woody, big branches. But when they're still in a shoot time, uh, pull them out. You can also use spacers. Uh, imagine a yardstick with a notch in each end or a ruler with a notch in each end. And as that branch is growing up, you put the ruler in, and use this, the trunk and the branch, stick the ruler in the middle, and it holds them apart. That does the same thing if they're younger shoots. Good. All right, I've got notes. Uh, I missed the water schedule for College Station. We were told yesterday, last night, I believe, uh, if you're odd-numbered or if you're even-numbered. Do you have that information? Because I don't feel like calling the city. Okay. Um, let me see here. I'm looking, let me, I'm trying to pull it up here. I, I don't know it off the top of my head. So I have to call the city. Okay. Uh, well, just give me one second here. Um, <laughs> I'll find it for you. The, the main thing to remember on, on this, uh, uh, watering thing is watering properly. You know, of course, you, you want to water when you're supposed to water, but yes. uh, giving it a good soaking so that you wet the soil deeply, and then don't water for a while, and let the yes. plants let's the let the plants do that kind of work. There's a website called bvwatersmart dot tamu dot edu like oh, but be dear young man I i'm so old and i don't do things okay. like you young people do. i get I have it a telephone i get huh? it. <laughs> <laughs> i get it no problem uh let's see here i'm going to see if they have anything on that you may have to just go to the city uh water <laughs> website and, and i don't know jennifer if you're listening today if you would call in and kind of clarify that it would help me i have trouble doing two things at once here so trying to look it up and talk on the radio is kind of Kind of difficult. I don't see a watering schedule on there, so. 
Well, it was on the radio last night. Oh, okay. And and, and I forgot. If, I didn't write it down. But thank you. You're very, very good and very important to our whole county. Oh, my Thanks goodness. Again. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see here. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689. Or by email at garden success at tamu.edu. Garden success at tamu.edu. We've actually got Jennifer on the line if you'd like to discuss okay, this watering schedule. Let's let her clarify that before I muddy the waters yeah. anymore. Hey, how are you? I'm good. I, I, was, um, I just came in from telling a business that they should not water between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. They were watering now and then got in the car and turned on the radio and I heard you say, Jennifer, if you're listening, call in and tell us about the water schedule. <laughs> oh, you, you can't hide, man. We find you everywhere yeah. you are. Well, That's someone fine. someone had asked about the schedule and I, w I went to bbwatersmart.tamu.edu and I, I just didn't immediately yeah. see on there. So could you clarify that? Yeah, initially, um, like last month, anybody who got an irrigation checkup, I was telling them to water two days a week based on address. Um, but it was slightly different than what Wixon and Welburn had put out. And so okay. once they put out their schedules, I just I told the rest of the operations staff at College Station, I said, let's just do the same two days per week as they're doing. And mm -hmm. that way, everybody is all on the same page. So if you have an um, even-numbered address, it's Thursday and Sunday. And I remember that because that's my schedule. And then if you have an odd-numbered address, it's uh, Wednesday and Saturday. Okay, Thursday, Sunday for even, Wednesday, Saturday for odd. Okay, I'll write that down yeah. here so I can I can mention that as we go forward. I, I'd like to ask you a yeah. question. I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot here because I know there are a lot of water systems around, but I've, I've been sometimes, to, or I've received information sometimes from water systems that say don't water between like, I don't know, it's 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. or something. And I thought, of course, that's a time when our pressure is lower. I thought that was the time we should water. So can you kind of clarify that? Yeah, and I noticed that Wixon had put out something about that. Um, and I think what's happening with that, I mean, we noticed some lower pressures, um, you know, the, uh, during that time too recently. But um, that is a good time to water. But I think when you have 50,000 customers all pulling from the same water tower, like they they fill usually overnight, and then they'll start to drain um, early, you know, later in the morning um, when everybody gets up and they're you know, showering and doing all that stuff. Um, so that allows the water system to kind of catch up on storage. Okay. So if they've had a lot of demand, so I've started telling people don't water on Mondays because Mondays were such a huge uh, water demand day for us. So that'll allow us to be caught up and ready for the week. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just the, um, it's too much demand on the system. And if you have too much demand on your system, um, and you're not filling your towers, then your water pressures can drop. So okay. speaking in general, I think that's why water systems will, will say that. And um, certainly we don't really need to worry. You know, we can water at night now because we I don't think we need to worry about fungal diseases. It's not getting cold, cool enough to promote any of that. Yeah, it, it just, uh, you know, the evaporation rate and everything is so good uh, compared to later in the day or even the early evening. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, that's why I like to encourage watering in the morning. So I, I guess uh, w yeah. for for your system there, though, uh, for uh, College Station, it it's not become a major factor, or is is it enough to no, where we? Not, not a major factor, but I think if people can um, get by with like starting their sprinklers at like eight thirty or nine at night, um, it certainly would not hurt to do okay. that. All right. I have mine. I, I program my controller to come on after sunset, and then it just runs and does its thing and okay. stops. All right. Yeah. Oh, well, thank so, you. So, yeah, my big three are no watering on Monday, follow your two-day-a-week watering schedule, and then no irrigation for college station, no irrigation between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. because that's the highest evaporation part of the day. Right. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you You're welcome. Uh, weighing in. Uh, we're going to go back to the phones now. The number is 
uh, and uh, we're going to talk to David. Hello, David, and thank you for waiting. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, thanks for taking the call. I am following up with a couple of photos that I sent in of the fig tree. Yes. And I have two fig trees. One is the Celeste that's of interest, and the other one is 100 feet away. It's a brown turkey fig. And the Celeste fig tree, the it drops a lot of leaves in the last two or three weeks, and it has a little bit of white uh, maybe it's mold on the leaves, but I'm not sure because I'm mm -hmm. new. Yeah, I saw your photos, and uh, the white almost looks like it might be where water sprinkled on the leaf and then dried and left the, some residue behind. Um, I don't; it doesn't look like mold to me, and so that's just my best guess. Now, if you don't have a watering system doing that, then I guess we got to go back to the drawing board and, and try to figure out what it is. But the big issue for you is the leaf drop and and figs will do that when they get stressed. Now, the the water and the heat combined are stressing the figs. And, and so that in, in and of itself could be causing leaf drop if the soil is not being kept adequately moist. The other thing that happens with figs is they get a tiny uh, worm-like creature called uh, nematode on the roots in the soil. And nematodes love figs, and they love okra too, by the way, and several, many other plants. But if your if your fig tree has a significant nematode problem in the roots, those roots are going to be really instead of long and slender, they look more like the Mich Michelin Man, if if you kind of use that as mm. a mental picture. And the flow of water and nutrients through the roof is impaired. So now we've got huge demands, and not only tending to dry out a little bit, but the water it has, it's having trouble getting it through there. So I think it's a combination of those three factors in one form or another. Okay. So I <clears throat> I would agree on the uh, probably some heat and, and low water stress. Mm -hmm. I think I had a week or two okay. that I didn't water, and then I realized, okay, this needs to be watered directly. A um, couple of mornings I, I sprayed the leaves, so I would not rule out the the water residue from our hard water um and and maybe I'm, uh, there's just a little bit of a delay in the, in the plant responding and getting healthier mm -hmm. for probably one one and a half weeks i've been very sure to to check the soil and get it moist yeah yeah i think so should i expect it to kind of recover in in a few weeks and if not then i have another problem like the nematode i think i think that's that's probably the case, and we can we can take a look at it again. I tell you, I'm just seeing so many plant issues right now that um, it's really easy just to say hot and dry is the problem, and it, it can be other things, and it can be other things that contribute. You know, maybe uh, nobody is fully at none of the causes are fully at fault, but uh, they're all contributing to it. Yeah. Oh, one more factor is this: uh, Celeste is uh, one year versus a three-year-old and okay. um, the three-year-old is not, is in direct sun all the time and the and the one-year-old celeste is only um it's, it's shaded about half of the day under a, a bigger tree okay and so i thought it would be doing better since it's less heat exposed but it's it's struggle it, the other fig tree is not mm -hmm. only dropped one or two leaves in the last several weeks okay it's looking pretty decent yeah, well, you know, sometimes the soil within an area is not evenly moist due to various things, soil type, pattern, the, where the water flows and, and whatnot. But uh, I, I just, uh, I just make sure make sure dig down a few inches, feel the soil. If it's not wet, I would give it a good deep soaking around that okay. tree. Uh, figs tolerate a little bit of shade. You know, they don't like it. They want sunlight uh, so they can make the carbohydrates, but. Uh, they'll tolerate a little bit of shade, but I don't think shade is causing the the problem either on that fig. Okay, and right. probably the the neem oil uh, countermeasure is not so important for me to try it right no, now. No, I, I would not. There's nothing there's nothing insect wise on that that fig tree for you to spray. Okay, it says it says it's supposed to be like a fungicide, but I but yes. I'll, I'll just hold off. Well, neem oil, not, uh, if, it, if it's the oil form of neem, it also has the ability 
to uh, some other insects, and it has some, some fungicidal properties, especially against powdery mildew. But, uh, you know, bacterial scorch and all the other things, it's not going to do anything for. Okay. And figs don't, okay, I'll, figs I'll don't to my a... knowledge, get powdery mildew. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you for the call. Uh, we're going to go back to the phones now and talk to Edith. Hello, Edith. Hi. Hi, Skip. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, so I emailed a few pictures. I um, saw them. I, okay, yeah. So I'm having trouble with uh, my petunias. Um, mm -hmm. I had two pots of them, and one of them um, completely dried out for the most part. Uh, the leaves are dead, flowers mm -hmm. are dead. Um, but I'm noticing now those same black spots um, and those things that look like little seeds on my tomatoes now. Yes. So that's what's making me think that it's a pest, but I just have no experience with any of this, so I wanted to, okay. to see what your opinion was. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, petunias in Texas summers are not happy not and barely <laughs> survive. Uh, and then you make it a Texas summer with 100 degree for several weeks and no rain mm -hmm. in sight. And, and now you, you know, I know you're hand watering them, but uh, it's, it's even worse. But mm -hmm. uh, as our spring petunia blooms begin to fade a little bit, we don't have as much bloom as we did early. You can go in and you can shear the plant back by about a third. Mm -hmm. And if you will look at your plants right now, what you'll see is the foliage is way down further in the plant. And the ends of those long shoots have these little star-like strappy things that look mm -hmm. kind of like leaves, but they're not. And the seed pods in there, and they're producing a lot of seeds. And so you just cut that back, all that seed production, and uh, then water and fertilize the plant and invigorate new vegetative growth, new leaves and shoots. And that can get it back into blooming again. Although I wouldn't expect in this weather it to be a very fast improvement. But you you can keep them going longer by shearing them back uh, when they start to go all twiggy with the, with the blooms and seeds or, uh, the, and, and then invigorating them. And I think that's the primary problem. Also in your pictures, there's a lot of speckled leaves and, and mm -hmm. uh, th there are a number of insects that suck the juices out of plants. Uh, one one common one you see around town is on lantanas. You look at a lantana leaf and it's got all this whitish in the leaf. And that's mm -hmm. a little piercing sucking insect. That they're hard to find. You know, you turn leaf over and he's not there. Uh, they, they know how to get away and be unseen, but they're hard to catch. But they do suck a lot of juices out of the leaves and they'll turn a lantana leaf almost white eventually. And this is happening on your petunias as well. There are several different insects that can do this. And so that's where an insecticidal spray could be helpful um, uh, to, to kind of shut them down and give the plant a chance. But you'll notice all of those long shoots that have bloomed and now have the pods developing on them, they just need to be cut back. And so I wouldn't spray that. I would cut them all back, and then if you need to spray, then you could do that. Okay, so even with this problem, you would still apply fertilizer? I would, uh, but okay. not a lot of dry synthetics, which is a salt-based fertilizer. I would, okay. I would cut them back, and I would take one of the products you mix in water in a very dilute, okay. the, look at the label, it'll give you a very dilute um, amount, and I might even dilute it a little more than that and just use that to water the plants. And so you're not going to burn them with that. That is a super diluted form of that fertilizer. Okay, and that would work with the tomatoes as well? Yeah, tomatoes, they they don't want to set in the heat, especially the larger fruited types. So with tomatoes, you can, you got a couple of options. If your plants look bad, diseases, spider mites, you know, mm -hmm. just all the things, if they look bad, I would root the tips of those tomato shoots and get rid of the old mother plant and start over with fresh new ones. And now's the time to do that. So you have tomatoes in the fall. Uh, if the plants look good, you can leave them. And sometimes people will cut them back partway 
and let the tomato re-sprout fresh new growth. But by this time okay. of the year, there's a lot of issues that have happened on those leaves that are insect, uh, mite, and disease related. So, uh, yeah. So, okay, those pictures are from the petunias. I, I didn't include pictures of the tomatoes. It's just that I'm, I'm starting to notice that issue. Yeah just now this week so okay well, I can yeah I, I've been telling people for a while now uh, just you know you, you can cut the end off a tomato let's say you cut six inches off the end of a shoot you pull off the bottom mm -hmm. leaves two or three leaves stick it in a glass of water and it'll root and then you can pot it up or mm -hmm. what I like to do more is to just put them put the end of the shoot down at the soil and cover it up with some soil and keep it moist and in about two weeks, you can cut it loose from the mother plant because it will already have developed a new root system out there near the end that where you covered it up with moist soil. And the, then you just get the mother plant with all the diseases and spider mites and aphids and everything else and just get it out of there. Uh, okay. and, and it's a way of starting fresh. Okay, perfect. Um, is there any fertilizer that you would, like any fertilizer brand that you would recommend? Yeah, we don't recommend brands. Um, the okay. way to know how to fertilize your garden, like the tomatoes, is mm -hmm. to have a soil test done. Uh, you can go to soiltesting.tamu.edu, soiltesting.tamu.edu, and you can find the, it's called the Urban Soil Test Form. It, click click to it on the website and uh, fill it out and take your soil in. It'll tell you how to take a good, accurate sample and they'll give you the results. And then what you'll see is, well, maybe I don't need any phosphorus or maybe I need a little mm -hmm. extra magnesium. And you can fertilize the soil and build up that bank account exactly with the right things rather than just buying a store-bought blend that's going to have some ratio of nutrients that may mm -hmm. or may not be the best for your particular garden soil. Okay. All that right. Way. Thank you very much. All right, Edith. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our phone number, 845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Uh, I want to, let's see. Uh, Bob had a question about some wax myrtles. The leaves are kind of shriveling, turning brown, and dropping. Uh, two different bushes planted fairly recently, but at different times fairly recently. And uh, again, I think that when you put a new plant in the ground, it takes a while. If it's a tree or shrub uh, we're talking about here, it takes a while for them to develop a somewhat extensive root system. So their roots are reaching far and wide to get moisture wherever it can find it. And so a, a new plant still has its roots in that cylinder of soil that came out of the pot. Uh, and as a result, uh, when we go into hot dry, it, it would be almost as if that was sitting in a pot on top of the ground still. Uh, and so how long does it take for that little pot to dry out? Well, one day, typically. Uh, and so you put it down in the ground and you're watering all around it and the soil is moist, but that little root ball there is pumped dry quickly and water's not wicking in from the sides fast enough uh, and that's what makes summer such a touch and go time to plant uh, because we you can plant in summer but you got to keep that root ball wet without keeping it soggy wet and cutting off oxygen to the roots uh, until it gets roots established uh, and I think that's probably what you're seeing. So I would just, you know, kind of reach down around the plants. I keep saying this, but the, the, the best moisture meter is the fingers on the end of your hand. Uh, and I say the best, meaning you can reach down there, dig a few inches down and feel the soil. And you don't get the exact reading that way, like a, a technical instrument would give you. But you can tell the difference between, hey, this is getting dry or this is sopping wet or something in between and water accordingly. Uh, it doesn't mean every day when you water you got to go out and feel the soil, but you kind of get an idea where these plants are and where this soil is. Some of you listening have sandy soil, some of you have clay soil, uh, some of you have well amended soil in raised beds that store bought mixes uh, for bed mixes, uh, and it's all it's all different. So I uh, hope that hope that helps, Bob. Uh, I don't think you're dealing with any disease unless. You absolutely waterlog the plants for extended periods of time, and that root ball is sitting in a hole in the clay, and it's essentially an underground bathtub. That would be the only other possibility, but I don't think that's the case there. 
Uh, let's see, uh, Ronnie uh, had asked about a mystery weed and sent me a picture, and that is crabgrass, and he wanted a selective herbicide. Uh, you, you can't kill grass in grass. Like if, if you've got grassy weeds in your St. Augustine or Zoysia lawn, uh, you can't spray something and kill the grass but not the lawn. But there are things that kill grass but don't kill broadleafs. So if you have grassy weeds growing in your petunia beds and your lantana beds and things like that, there are products you can spray that will kill the grassy weeds and not kill your desirable plants. And those uh, have names that indicate what they are, like a grass be gone type name, uh, the grass getter, or grass beater, those type of things. And the ingredients, uh, sethoxidem and fluazophobe, typically sethoxidem uh, is what you find. You go to a good garden center that uh, has folks that are uh, trained and educated to help you with, with finding the answers to those kinds of things, and they can direct you to those products. Uh, crabgrass is an annual. Uh, it does reseed profusely, but it's not. The plant itself won't be there next year, uh, but its seeds will be around. So getting rid of it before it scatters too many seeds is a good idea. The real problem uh, with weeds is bare soil. Uh, wherever the soil is bare, nature plants a weed. That's a good saying, and it's true. Nature does not like bare soil, and that's that's good because bare soil is not good for the earth. I mean, it erodes, it crusts, and all kinds of issues. So nature covers it up with weeds. And so when you have a lawn that's thin, you're going to have more weed problems. Uh, I'm seeing lawns all over town that are being watered or not watered at all or barely watered, and, and they're, they're going to hit a stage where if it ever rains again, they'll bounce back, but they'll bounce back very thin with a lot of places where sunlight can hit the soil. And so you would expect the weed problems in, in the future seasons to be a little worse in those kind of spots. Uh, so it, the number one thing is if, if you it's a bed or something you can mulch, do that. If it's your lawn, then mow, water, and fertilize the proper way. We have a lot of information on extent, in extension for that. But mow, water, and fertilize to create a nice, dense lawn and that chokes out most weed problems that are especially the ones that are coming from annual weeds uh, over time. So I hope that hope that helps. But that is crabgrass. Uh, let's uh, now go back to the phones and take a call from Robert. Hello, Robert. Hello. Um, I have noticed a plant this year called a red yucca. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more I read about it, the better I like it. I'd like to start some. I'm reading a site from San Francisco that's giving me some recommendations. wonder if you've tried it and have any pointers on how to get a red yucca plant to grow. Yeah, red yucca is a, is a very tough, uh, easy plant to grow. It wants sunlight. It doesn't want to be in the shade. Uh, it puts up with some pretty crummy soil conditions, actually, although like many plants, if you give it a better soil condition, it may do a little bit better, grow a little faster. Uh, it has those beautiful arching uh, bloom heads with the, the flowers on them. It's almost always kind of a, they call it red yucca, but it's really a, not coral, what is it, a pink coral kind of yeah, the sure color. Yeah. yeah, and uh, I don't have a, a color vocabulary to be able to describe <laughs> it accurately. Uh, but actually, there is a new type, a new variety, and you can see it at the gardens on campus at A&M, called brake lights. And just like the name would make you think, it's redder. Uh, and it's uh -huh. a little bit more compact, um, brake lights, and, and it's redder, so if that matters. Uh, the original comes in a yellow form as well, so uh -huh. it's a little harder to find. But you just plant them, uh, get them watered a little bit to help them through. I probably would wait until fall to plant it. Just It would survive planting okay. now probably, but um, I don't know. It, uh, I'm, I'm uh, collecting seeds right now. A uh, recommendation is you look for a seed pod that's okay. pretty mature. Yes and um, put it in some soil. I'm surprised yeah. it takes as long. Uh, they're saying sometimes it takes quite a while to germinate. Yes. A little surprised at that, but we'll try to be patient. Yes, and I don't know red yucca germination off the top of my head. I don't know if any kind of treatments are necessary first. I would expect not. Okay. Uh, but it may be that it's better if it goes through a, a period of cold, which we we, oh, uh, okay. we imitate that by putting them in moist sand and a Ziploc in the refrigerator. Oh, right. leave, leave them for a month and bring them out, and they think winter happened. 
but I don't know that red yucca needs that. If it was a peach seed, it would need that, and, uh -huh. and many other kinds of plants need that. But uh, I don't know on red yucca. But you you could find that online. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That. But you got to be patient because if you're growing them for a seed, that's what I'm it's going it to be a while like before you have six foot red yucca blooms oh, okay, uh, flopping yeah. all over the place. All right. Appreciate it. Thank all you. Right. Thank you for the call, Robert. Uh, see, we got time for another call. Our phone number is 845-5689, 845-5689, email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. Let's talk about some things going on around town. Uh, tonight, Thursday night, July 7th, the Post Oak chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas has a program called From Landscape to Wildscape. Gardening for Wildlife at Home. Uh, Laura Simpson will be speaking on that topic, and she has been transforming her Houston home gardens into pollinator-friendly habitat. Uh, and, it, you know, this is a time like this when we're having drought. That's a, that is a time where we start thinking about different ways of landscaping, maybe. Uh, she's a member of the Native Plant Society of Texas, the Houston chapter, and the North American Butterfly Association. So this will be uh, a, a presentation online via Zoom, and it begins tonight at 6.30 p.m. So get your pen and paper out, and you want to write down this address. It's tinyurl dot com slash frog fruit t-i-n-y-u-r-l dot com slash frog fruit one word and you can go there and find out how to be part of tonight's program i think uh, i think that'd be a very interesting one a lot of a lot of interest in that uh, let's see, the, on uh, July 23rd, the Brazos Valley Museum of Natural History will present an annual Wish Upon a Butterfly event. That is from 9.30 a.m. to noon at 3232 Briarcrest Drive in Bryan. Uh, the event will include a butterfly release to honor someone, uh, perhaps a, a past loved one. Uh, you, you can buy a ticket uh, per family. One ticket per family will get you into the museum, including an observational beehive. Boy, that, that's a fun one for the kids. Uh, butterfly displays, live music, refreshments, and activities. Now, if you dress up like a caterpillar or butterfly, you receive a gift. And I checked my closet, and I, I can't find my caterpillar and butterfly suit, so I'm going to have to fashion something so I can get that free gift. But it's, it's, uh, it's free to attend if you dress up like a caterpillar <laughs> or a butterfly. Uh, uh, or actually, the event is free to attend. Uh, I believe. I'm reading both things in here, both ways. So maybe someone listening uh, can clarify it in the next three minutes. Uh, butterflies can be pre-purchased for $20 or 6 for $100 for that butterfly release outside. And you can find more information at brazosvalleymuseum.org. Uh, Saturday the 23rd, 9.30 a.m. to noon out at 3232 Broadcrest Drive in Bryan. All right, I think that's about it for the activities going on. Things slow down a little bit in summer because it's such a, a difficult uh, time. Uh, as I was visiting uh, with Jennifer a little bit earlier, uh, we talked about um, the um, watering schedules and things. I would really encourage you to go online to bvwatersmart.tamu.edu. That website is it's it's wonderful. Number one, you can sign up to get reminders each week, and I do, uh, as to how long do you run your system. And maybe you've got a pop-up sprayer, or maybe you have a drip system, or maybe you have one of those rotors that sprays the yard and goes back and forth across the yard, or a multi-stream rotor that sprays several little fingers of water out there. Each puts out water at a different rate, and when you go in and sign up, you tell them what you got, and they tell you how to water accordingly. So it's based on a weather station, and there are a number of weather stations around the Bryan College Station area, all, actually all through Brazos County, uh, where you get good local information uh, on the, the solar intensity, the temperature, the wind speed, and all the factors that determine how often do we need to water. And so I would encourage you to go to bvwatersmart.tamu.edu. By the way, also on that website, uh, there's some good information in the form of videos. You can look at uh, the, the um, lawn care area, one of our uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Young, 
Young Ki Jo in Plant Pathology has put information on the most common uh, diseases of uh, St. Augustine, for example. There are in, there's a section with information on how to conserve, and there are several videos that are very informative, uh, helping you uh, do an irrigation checkup on your system or just understand the basics of, uh, of irrigation. So I would encourage you to check out bvwatersmart.tamu.edu. Uh, let's see, I had a question uh, about soybeans and fava beans, and Lewis, I'm going to need to do a little more research on that. Soybeans, even though edamame, I guess, is a garden crop, uh, or could be, uh, I am not up on soybeans. I'm going to have to get some help from the agronomists on that one to be able to answer your question. Uh, someone had asked about information, more information on solarization. Uh, I think I've talked about this before, but uh, basically uh, you use the sun to heat up your soil to kill weed seeds and pests. So maybe you had squash vine borer in the spring and they chewed up your vines and then they dropped down, went to the soil and made a pupa under the surface. Solarization gets so hot it kills them. Uh, weed seeds in the upper four inches or so of soil are going to be killed by that. And what you do is you put clear plastic over soil during the hottest time of the year. We're there. And uh, you first water the soil and roto or you rototill it. You make your beds. You do all the soil work you're going to do for your fall garden. And then if, if it's nice and moist, if not, you want to water it. So you want it moist and then cover it with clear plastic, cover the edges with dirt so no warm air can escape out from under there. And that sun will heat that soil up to way over 100 degrees, 140 degrees, even, even a few inches down. Uh, it takes about six weeks to do it effectively, but that is something that can be done. A lot of people's gardens aren't set up for that. You wouldn't solarize a little, you know, three foot wide bed uh, just because the cooling effect from the sides and everything would overcome the benefit of the heat, I think. Uh, but for a large area, just buy a, one of those big sh uh, rolls of, of clear plastic. Clear, not black. You want the sun to shine through and heat up the soil, not to shine on the black plastic and heat up the plastic. Uh, so that's how you do it. Well, you've been listening uh, to Garden Success, and we're here every Thursday from 12 to 1. Please tell your friends and neighbors who might be gardeners or maybe thinking about being gardeners about the show uh, so that they can join us as well. If you'd like to listen to past shows, those are posted online. Go to the KAMU uh, website, and you can find more information there. Just look for Garden Success. You can watch some or listen to some past shows. Uh, and if you uh, want to listen live online, you can also do that uh, as well. But we always look forward to getting to talk to you. That's one of my favorite parts of the week is, is getting to talk to you about all the things that are going on out there in your landscapes and the kinds of questions that uh, you might have. Uh, we're going to be back again next Thursday, and hopefully by then one of you will have done a rain dance and we can talk about how nice it is to have wet soil. But if you are out there doing that, please let me know. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley. Garden Success is brought to you in part by the Arbor Gate, featuring unusual plants, artisan-created decorative pieces, and a constantly changing array of items that bring beauty, comfort, and even flavor to the home and garden. Arbor Gate, 15635 FM 2920, Tomball, Texas, 281-351-8851 or arborgate.com. Garden Success is also brought to you by the Farm Patch, 3519 South College Avenue in Bryan, 979-822-7209.